science, and we are studying how we should start our happiness and how our happiness will be end. And as we are called to be Christian followers of Christ, we have the identity to be a happy person with influence and a person who have a happy enlightenment in, in our life. But let's finish this series of happiness talking about happy good works. The happiness of doing a good work. Yes, there's words that are good and there are words that are not good. If you do good works, you're going to be happy for doing that. If you are not doing the good works, definitely you cannot experience happiness in full. So I'm here to challenge you this morning to pursue the good words in your life so you can really experience happiness in your life. So you can really test and taste what is happiness from heaven. Not from this world. Not from what this world has, but what this happiness that comes from heaven has for you. Uh, can I turn all this light in front of me? Yes, thank you. So if we want to talk about happiness, we have to talk about what we are. The Bible said that we are the soul of the air and we are the light of this world. It means that we are people with influence. It's called it the kingdom influence. As our theme this year 2016 in CN is to let your kingdom come. We are studying the book of Matthew as our main curriculum. And we are studying the Beatitudes, our main curriculum. We are studying the Sermon of the Mountain, as our main curriculum. And I'm going to give you an extra teaching later. I'm preparing the series of the parables of Matthew. So be excited about that, because it's coming soon. <laughs> but here, yes, we have an influence that we are access. We, 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 we have access for its influence, and we have access to share this influence, to deliver this influence from us to the world. The problem is that we don't know the influence that we have, and we don't know that we have the power to give away this influence. As soon as you realize the power that you have, the influence that you have, that not come from you, because you're probably going to look at yourself and say, Pastor, look at me, what can I do for this world? <laughs> I asked the same question to me many years ago, when God called me and said, God, what can I do for you? Look at me. And he say, you don't know what I'm going to do with you. So just sit down and relax and let me do my work. So God showed me that, yes, he can use every person in this world. Regardless, the physical condition, mental condition, spiritual condition, emotional condition. Regardless, whatever condition you have in your life, God can still use you. We have one night retreat the last weekend. And two brothers of our CM members give us a lecture. Leah was the first one. And she was talking about hope. The hope that we have in God who created this world out of nothing. And the hope that we have in Christ that he redeemed us from all our sins. And the hope that we have for our life until we get to heaven, that is a life that have a plan, a plan from God. So we can all be used by God. And no matter how awful we look, everyone here as like a stone, big rock, big stone without form, God can make in us a beautiful piece of art. Yes, we are here to know that even though we think that we have no influence in this world, it is God who will orchestrate the influence that you will share to this world that comes once again from the hands of God who is molding you, who is guiding you, who is using you. The kingdom of heaven has influence to all of us Show to the world 
what is the real style of light that brought everyone to happiness? We call it the kingdom's virtue. Yes, we studied at the beginning of this year the kingdom virtues, and we talked that there are more, of course, but we talk about just seven virtues. Truth are the first virtue of the kingdom of God. Because God is true, definitely we as children of God, we must reflect the truthness of God. God is grace, so we are living by grace. God is love, and we are here to love one another. God came to serve and not to be served. So we have the example of Jesus of servanthood. God give us power to have control in our life, our feelings, our desires, so we can make decisions right to not commit sins in God. God give us his justice, he justified it, but he also give us the same attribute of him to share justice, to looking for righteousness and justice in this world. And God humbly show us the way we follow his way, humble in this world, with gratitude in our life. Once again, we are here to be more like God, to be more like Jesus. And the only way that we can be happy in this world is to be more like him, to follow our Father in heaven. Children, they are happy when they imitate their parents. My children, they love to imitate me. I have talents innate in me because I'm from Latin America, different than many Koreans. When you play music in any place, in any gender, you will see my legs, they cannot be still. You will see my legs start to follow the beat. Whatever rhythm it is. Classical, pop, hip hop, salsa, merengue, lambada. <laughs> Whatever music you play, my body will follow automatically. Why? Because I was born in Latin America. And Latin American people, they yeah. bore dancing and they died dancing. It's true. You can go to a maternity, it's a hospital for babies. And you can see in the maternity, the doctors are listening to the radio when they are giving the, 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 the deliverance of the babies at the hospital. You don't see that there's a classical music in, in, in Latin American hospital. They are listening salsa when the babies are born. So you can see that babies are crying with rhythm, all right? It's not like here in Korea. I don't know how the Koreans baby cry when they were born. Ah, ah. But they, they cry with rhythm, like, ah, 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 right? And probably it's the same in Africa, right? <laughs> so they have this, this, this natural talent that I have with them. But when my kids, they see me when I play music or when I dance some Latin American music because suddenly on TV, on the radio, the music come out. My wife is the first one who is ashamed and said, stop that. But my kids, they love to imitate. They want to move like daddy move. And they make fun of that. Now the little one is, of course, my son. He have the innate genes to become a future dancer. I can promise you. you just wait a few years. He will be on TV. <laughs> Because as soon as he listens to music, he just, ah, oh, ah, oh, ah. Oh. But since we are in Korea, my two kids, they are ashamed to expose their talents. They have this from father, from daddy, this gene. But because mom is there, they are shy. <laughs> but as soon as nobody is looking at them, they, you can see that they are like squeezy. They are more fast than a, a serpent or a snake moving around. <laughs> yes. They like to imitate daddy because they see daddy moving that way. We as Christians, we also must be happy to imitate our Lord Jesus. We must be happy to imitate our Father in heaven, our friend, best friend, Jesus Christ. 
And the only way we can imitate him is to be more like him. That's why he gives us the way of happiness. You're going to be happy if you imitate me, say the Lord Jesus. If you are more like me, if you are poor in spirit, if you are mourning for your sins, if you are meek, if you are hungry and thirsty of righteousness, if you are merciful, if you are pure in heart, if you are a peacemaker, and if you endure persecution, you will be more like me, and you will be happy to be like that. You definitely are going to enjoy happiness if you experience that, what I experience. And I can assure you, say the Lord, that I do this with joy, with enthusiasm. I joyfully die for you, says the Lord, on the cross. Even though we cannot see a picture of Jesus smiling on the cross, but we can see, yes, his passion. His passion reflects that he's doing with all enthusiasm his climax miracle to save the world. In the time of Jesus, when he was in this war, there were three kinds of audience that were listening to him. You already hear about this in a few sermons uh, that I preached a few weeks ago. But just to re review that and to finish this series, there were three kinds of people in Jesus' time. And, and these people, they were listening to Jesus' sermons all the time. They were in contact with Jesus. They listen to what Jesus said, the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount. And as we say, there were three kinds of people. There were the traditionals, there were the utopians, and there were the zealots. The traditionals, they were called Pharisees. The Pharisees were the people who they tried to follow the tradition. The tradition of the law, the tradition of the Torah, the tradition of the, the Old Testament life. They love to keep this tradition in life. So these were the kind of people that they were ashamed that Jesus brought the tradition. They were furious because Jesus brought the tradition. And they tried to kill Jesus because they, he brought the tradition. So he tried to not follow the tradition. It doesn't mean that Jesus didn't follow the law or break the law. He just break the tradition. And Jesus, we're going to talk later in future sermons, that he kept the law, but he didn't want the tradition be over the commandment of God, over the love of God. And the reason that the Pharisees killed Jesus because he brought the tradition instead to break the law. Break the law. Jesus kept the law, but he didn't keep the tradition. So that made the traditionalist people in his time crazy about it. And they tried to kill him because of that. Then there were the utopians. These were the kind of people that they do whatever they want. They don't care about the consequences in his life. They were called the Sadducees. The Sadducees, they tried to be part of the tradition. But sometimes they break the tradition because they say, oh, it's too old to follow. We have to innovate things. We have to create things. But they don't want to just keep the law because it's part of the identity of the Jews' nationality, but they want to experience something more. They want to experience what foreigners experience, the neighbors experience, and there was a Roman empire there. It was a Roman empire that they, they tried to show to the world new things. And the Sadducees were excited. They were friends of the Romans. And they, yes, do whatever they want, like the Romans did in, his, in, in, the, in Jesus' time. And they didn't regard the consequences of that. The Sadducees were the kind of people that today we see in this war. That, yeah, oh, well, there's religions in this war, there's Christianity in this war, but it's okay to do things like not going to church. It's okay to just lie. A white line, they're because there's for them white light and black lights. I don't know, the Bible they never mention about black or white lights or yellow or green. There's just light and lies. So they just excuse everything. But since there is no consequences of their acts, they just keep doing. 
They didn't understand what is the grace and the universal grace of God. And many Christians today, they don't understand that we are living in the time of grace. That everything is permissible under God's grace. But it will be one day when God will judge the living and the dead. And everybody will be judged according to their deeds. These were the Sadducees. These were the Ethiopians in Jesus' time. But there were a third kind of people. This, it's, they were called the Zealots. The Zealots. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, there were 400 years of silence. There were nothing about Israel's story because the Bible is the story of Israel, but it's the story of salvation. It's not the story in the tale of what happened historically in Israel, but it's the story of salvation and Israel was involved as an example of nations. In these four hundreds of silence, where there were no prophets, there were nobody, <coughs> Israel's story continued. And the Israel story continues saying that yes, they didn't want to submit under a foreigner government. Remember that after Israel was taken into captivity in Babylon and they re went back to Jerusalem by Nehemiah and Ezra, they rebuilt the temple, they rebuilt the city, they rebuilt the, 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 the walls, as you know, Nehemiah walls. So they tried to be independent and not under any government. But after these kings who helped Israel to rebuild the city die and, and, and forget about what they promised to Israel. The Israel, they didn't want to be under the control of any other foreign countries or kings. So when the, the other countries and empires tried to, to submit Israel, there were a group of people that they called themselves the Zealots. They actually went to a place called the Masada in Israel, where they built a fortress and they ran away from the persecution of this war against the foreign empires. So this movement was disappeared and the, government, the, the Roman Empire came to the place where Israel was set. It. So there were no more leaders who remained alive from this movement in Masada. But the influence that happened in Masada continued for generations. So when Jesus came to this world as a human being, there were still people who called themselves the Zealots. Not because they were the, the survivors of this revolution or this movement years ago, but because they have this passion, this, this, an, this anxious to be free. But since they didn't know the spirit of the Lord, as we just saying, they didn't know what is real freedom. In this time, people were waiting for the coming of the Messiah. And the Pharisees, the traditionalists, they couldn't understand Jesus is the Messiah. The Sadducees, who they didn't care about the consequences of their sins, they didn't want Jesus judging for their sins. And the zealots who saw Jesus as a potential zealot, but Jesus was not any zealot, they were disappointed that Jesus was friend of the Romans. He held a centurion. He healed a centurion servant. They were disappointed. What kind of zealot is Jesus? He looks like a revolutionary, but he's not one of us, they said. They tried to take power by their hands. They tried to take control and give influence into the nation by power, by force, by be armored. But they couldn't. In this time of law of Jesus, he called his followers to be the soul and the light of this world. He called them disciples. But it's interesting that amongst the 12 disciples that Jesus called, there were one called it the Zealot. Scripture said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 2 to 4, 
These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James of ZVD, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus. Among the 12 disciples of Jesus, among all these names with reference of parents, with reference of of hometowns, he, before the one who betrayed Jesus, that was Judas Iscariot, that's the last name of his father, he called it Simon. But we have another disciple that is called Peter. But this Simon is called the Zealot. Now, if we contemporize this word, it's like a, I'm calling members of CEM from all the nations. I call one from Korea, I call one from USA, one from uh, Oceania, one from Africa, one from uh, Latin America. We are two now, one of me. And then I call one from the Middle East. And I will call one who was a former ISIS soldier. And then I will say, okay, this is Nancy, this is Walter, this is Jonas, this is uh, Peter, this is John, and this is uh, Simon, who was an ISIS terrorist. What would people feel and understand about this person that I introduced as a terrorist? So they call it, well, this is Simon, this is Peter, this is John, this is Bartholomew, this is uh, uh, Judas, and there's a terrorist here. What a reputation. What an introduction. What a curriculum for a person who wants to follow Jesus and a person who wants to be used by God as a soul and the light of the world. I'm sure that Jesus intentionally called Simon the Zealot or Simon Zealots because he needed a person with passion, a person with energy, a person who cannot just, okay, when Jesus say, now let's go to, to serve the world, to preach the gospel, to knock the doors of, of, of Israel houses, they would probably some kind of say, mm, yes, Lord, but they didn't move. They were kind of people that they say, okay, let's go and worship God in this way. And they were like, mm, okay, when this sermon is going to finish. But there was there, Simon the Silo that just said, amen, yes, Lord, right now, let's do it. This kind of person. I'm praying for a Silo here in CM. I'm praying a person who, whatever I say, just say amen to everything. And just do it like Peter without regardless what the consequence will be. A person who can walk on water just because the pastor said. <laughs> I need this kind of people. I need this kind of person to build a church in this city, in San, to change this city, to change the world. Jesus just needed 12 people to change the world. And we are more than 12 here. We are people with influence, and our influence have the identity of the soul and the light of this world. But let's focus on the last prayer of Jesus that he said to his disciple after he finished this introduction of the Sermon of the Mount. He said in verse 16, Let your light shine before men that they may see your good words and glorify your Father in heaven. After Jesus called the disciples to be the soul of the air, to be invisible in this world as leaders, but with effect, he called those who will be exposed as leaders, as the light of the world. But he said in conclusion that it is in fact our good words that will be seen. And it will be our good word that will make God's being glorified. Are we made 
the name of Jesus being glorified by our good deeds. If your words or your deeds not glorify God by any other person who see your deeds or words, then your words are not good works. <laughs> I'm not saying that your words are bad words. <laughs> I'm just saying that your words are not good words. What is the difference about that? Am I contradicting? <laughs> like Jonah said in the retreat. Sometimes the Bible seems like it's contradicting itself. Sometimes people speak like it's contradicting itself. But it's not contradicting. You go, your war can be good war for you. Can be good war for people. But this good war cannot be a word that will glorify God. We, as a soul and the light of the world, we have to understand what are the good words that will make God's name be glorified? What are the good words that may God's name be known among the nations? For you, if you are a student, it's a good word to study. You must study. So you don't say, Pastor, I want to be a disciple of Christ, so I decided to not go to academia anymore. I decided to not go to the university anymore. I decided to not study math anymore because I just want to do God's work. <laughs> That's no excuse for not study. Studying is a good work, but you must go an extra mile. You must go an extra kilometer. You must do a good work that will glorify God and make his name known among the nations. Maybe you are doing a good work, feeding your, feeding your children, giving them the education, working with your spouse, your friend, your parents, to have a, a, a safety life. I don't, I don't say a luxury life because nobody's rich here, but yes, at least we try to do the best, to live the best life we can for the future of our kids. My, I myself as a pastor, I try to pursue the same thing. But... If we are not doing what is the first thing, if we are not keeping our first love, that is, may God's name be glorified and may God's name be known among the nations, then we are not doing our good work. We are useless. We have no salt or we have no saltiness in our soul. And the Bible is clear here. If you go back, open your Bibles again and see what the Bible said in verse 13. You are the soul of the air, but if the soul loses its saltiness, how can it be salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and tripped by men. Now, if we as the soul of the air, we have no saltiness, whatever you do is useless. Whatever you do in this war, making money, have cars, good apartment, wearing nice clothes, spend your time, your, your energy, meeting friends, it's useless. You will be, and all that you do, thrown away. And people will step on it. They will stand on your business. They will stand on your family. They will stand on your children's. They will stand on your life. And you will be miserable in this war, even though you have everything. And you can see how many people who have a lot of things, a lot of money, they live miserable life because they have no saltiness in their life. Also it says here in verse 15, Neither do people light a lamp and put it under the ball. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Like a light cannot be hiding or hidden, sorry. Like a city on a hill cannot be without light for the community. Our life also as Potential leaders of this war have to be exposed, has to be shown for people that they can see. But what, what are they going to see? Our good cars? Oh, now he used to have a Hyundai, now he have a BMW. No, that's not what people have to see. They don't, we are not here to show our prosperity. 
The Jews people, they try to show the prosperity among the nations to, to get respect from the nations. That's what they're understanding. But they lost the first love in doing that. They didn't love God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their strength, with all their mind, because they were loving the other gods. And they were loving and serving Mammon, the god of money, the god of prosperity, instead to serve God. We, as the light of the world, we have to understand that, yes, we are called to show good deeds. What are these good deeds that will glorify God? What we can do to glorify God? What we can make people come to God as an invisible spy in this world who will bring out people for the cause of saving souls? For Christ. God has created us from the beginning to this time of history to do good works. We have the calling. First Peter 2 9 says, <clears throat> But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. So you are called to declare praises to God. You are called to show light to this world. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's work, make sheet, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So these good works are not something that we have to invent it. Pastor, I don't know what to do to glorify God. I don't know what to do to be the soul of the, the, and the light of the world. Because I don't have good ideas. I don't have new ideas. My brainstorm is, is blocked so, with so much stress. No, you don't have to create good words. They are already created for you. God already will, is, is showing you and he will show you the good words that he created for you to glorify his name. What is the first thing that God created for you to glorify his name? is another person. God created human people. He created you. And he is still creating more people so you can show his words on your life first by going to another person and say that God created you. As easy as that. It's simple. You don't have to, okay, what should I do? Just go to another person, another human being created by God and say, hey, are you okay? How are you today? They will say, I'm fine, thank you. I don't think so. <laughs> because people just mechanically respond, hi, how are you? Fine, thank you. And you? That's English grammar, basic English grammar. But they don't mean in that. Is you search their life and say, are you sure you are fine? If they are your friends, if they have relationship with you, they say, as a matter of fact, I have a terrible day. As a matter of fact, today is not like I expect it to be. And then you can have compassion with them. And you can show your compassion your mercy to them. Blessed are the merciful because they will receive mercy. And as you see these people who are suffering in this world, you can say, you know what? Yes, I sometimes suffer like you. I have sometimes stress like you. But you know how I overcome all my stress and all my days that are black in my life? dark in my life I just go back to my creator I just go back to the light that he created I just go back to Jesus my savior and that's why I'm here to show you that he created you too that he is able for you too and if you believe in here, he will help you to overcome 
you dark days. Who can resist for that kind of counseling? Who can oppose to that kind of encouragement? Who can say, oh, I don't want your counseling. I don't want anything about you. I don't want to hear that. Of course, what we have to do is to build relationships, to find common sense with people so they can borrow to us their ears. We can borrow their ears so we can be able to talk to them. That's what you have to do. That's what you have to invest. Maybe you have to invest money. Maybe you have to invest time. Maybe you have to invest your possessions, sharing something with them in order to gain their ears. But as soon as you gain their ears, you have to tell them the truth. You have to show them the way. And you have to give them an opportunity to meet the one who gives you life. John Stowe, in his book, The Sermon of the Mount, he said about the responsibility of the soul and the light. First thing, this is not literally, I don't quote it from the book, I just translate it from Spanish to English. So as I inter understand, he's saying, first thing, we have the responsibility to be different. Because the tragedy of the church of today is the tendency of conforming to the current culture instead of developing a Christ-like contra-culture. What that thought means with that? It means that today the church is no different than any clubs. <laughs> it's no much different than any other religion. In this world, we have the same activity. I mean, I, I was walking yesterday from Chombalsan. We came from the hiking uh, morning after the queue time in the retreat. And as we just waiting for the traffic light to change in order to come to church, I was looking at the next building. You know what the next building is, right? <laughs> I don't want to offense sensibility for anybody here, but yes, the Catholic Church. I was watching the cat, uh, looking at the Catholic building. And I was waiting for the traffic light. I was seeing the banner that they have in front of the tower of the Catholic building. And I say, what is different this building with my church building? I was thinking, what is different this Christianity in this city, <clears throat> excuse me, with the Christianity that we are showing in our church, in the next building? Even though these two buildings are too close to each other. It's just less than one minute that you can share this building. What is different what we are showing here and what they are showing there? You will depends on where you come from, you would say, well, there's no difference in Christianity or there's no much difference between Catholics and, and Protestants or Evangelicals. So why we try to find difference? But what I'm saying here is, what made our life different? That we don't see that this world, when they come to church, they say, well, I came looking for truth, I came looking for hope, I came looking for answers, and I just find people ignorant here. I find people that they don't know what they believe. I find people that they just come to church because they have nothing to do at home or out of home. What does people are looking at? And that's why this retreat was so important for, for me and for us, as I invited you to participate, to recognize that we need to be different. We need to be prepared. For Peter chapter 3, 15 said that we must be prepared to give an answer for the hope that we have. But if we Christians, we are not prepared to give an answer for what we believe, for the hope that we have in heaven, then what we are doing here have no saltiness, have no light. And we are just good for nothing. People who are sinners and looking for salvation, they will find us in this church. No answer, no discipleship, no way to go to hell. We must be tasty and we must be visible, says 
stop. The soul must not lose its saltiness. The lie must not be hidden. And third, he said, we must give or be given. You cannot let the soul be inside the container all the time. We cannot make Christian be Christian inside the church building all the time. We have to take out of this building. We have to take out of the container and spread out into the world. And then when they go into the world, like the Lord Jesus said, like wall, uh, like sheep among the walls, but you must be wise as a serpent and humble as a dove. Go into the world and have influence in this world, in your school, in your office, in your marketplace, in your neighborhood, and then you can see what your presence will change where you are and what we are doing. You must be visible so your leadership in some way with your behaviors, with your style of life, people will find a new way of living, a happy way of living. We must be wasted in our life as this light is wasted. You know how long this life will be on? We don't know. But as much as we use it, the time will be limited. Any time that we turn off our spirituality to the world, we are spending our energy. We are spending our knowledge. But the good news is this, that you won't lose your light. Don't be afraid to give away what you have learned, Don't, to, be a, a, to give away what you have received here, because you can come back the next Sunday to receive more. <laughs> Hallelujah. You can still come back to Christ every day in quiet time to be filled again with His Spirit. So don't worry to give away even your money, to give away even your time, to spend for the war what you have already received, because God will pour, pour out from heaven more and more what you need, because He said and He promised, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and you will have everything that you need. Amen. Nobody say amen, so nobody believes in this sermon. But yes, we must to be spread out and we must to let God use us and be spent in this war. So people will really, really praise our Father in heaven and glorify His name for our testimony. Just to finish the sermon, I just want to show you and what I caught it from Oswald Chambers. And he says <clears throat> in one of his quotations, the passion of Christianity comes from deliver, de deliberately signing away my own rights and becoming a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Until I do that, I will not begin to be a saint. Now what Chambers said is, I cannot say myself that I'm a Christian until I spend my influence in this world, my energy, my enthusiasm, my passion to this world. Because the passion of Christianity is to be the soul of the air, the passion of Christianity is to be the light of the world. And if you are not acting in this world as soul and light, the agents of the kingdom of heaven, then you have no passion, you have no saltiness, you have no energy. And even though you have everything that you need in this world, your life are miserable. Your life are empty. And as Jonah said on the retreat, if someone is empty inside, they were looking for something from outside, extra. And we see that people what they don't find in church, they will find in drugs, they will find in addictions, they will find in, in, in pornography, they will find in any other things that this world given to them. 
Why? Because Christians, we are not giving what we have. And if you lost your passion, if you love your light, then you are lo losing your love to Christ. Once again, God, Jesus, he needed a zealot. He needed Simon the zealot to continue giving an impact to this world. And today God is looking for those like Simon the Zillow have not the opportunity to be a, a terrorist, but to be a re revolutionary. And God is looking people who want to be revolutionaries, but not to be part of a terrorist group, but to be members of the Christian revolution. That is the love revolution. If you spell revolution, you will find out that there are three, four letters that is in, uh, in opposite way of reading. You will find the L, O, V, and E that will be the heart of your revolution. Yes, revolution is a spelling with love. And God wants you to be in the world but not from the world, an agent of revolution, an agent of revolution of love. That is the revolution of Christianity. Why? Because Christianity is only about love. It's not about war. It's not about pushing an agenda. It's not about performing an ad. It's about love. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish that have eternal life. How we can prove that we love our neighbors, our brothers, by giving our life like the Lord give his life for us. That's the love revolution that God wants us to do. He is here to call us. He is here to show us the way, the good words that he already prepared for you to an agent of changing, an agent of happiness as the soul and the light of this world. In Jesus' name, let's pray. Thank you, God.